We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us on this Monday. Coming to you live, I'm Nick Barris. The number on the screen, 737-7587. Have you voted yet? Did you watch the debates? Did you watch 60 Minutes last night? And what do you think about the next nine days before the election? Can anything happen between now and then significant that could change how things are going for the candidates right now, or the president and the candidate Joe Biden? And with us this morning is uh, Professor Schwartz from over at Vanderbilt. And Professor, we have a caller waited through the break. Let's take him real quick. We've got some other ones coming in. We'll go to Ron. Ron, good morning. Hi, Ron. Yeah, Hi. I got two questions for you. Sure. The first question is that um, if the candidates concede the election before the count and they come up to a question, will it be like Florida did down there where the Al Gore conceded and then there was a question on the voter count and um, they wouldn't allow them to, um, uh, they considered that um, uh, more important because he conceded and allowed it to um, um, wouldn't allow him to uh, do any more about it so he just let it let it lose but he also he won down there in Florida after they recounted the vote and period figured it out and the governor didn't even uh, wasn't notified and didn't know which counties that came up in. I have read that on the internet. How true it is, I don't know. And also the other question and the most important one, I noticed that the poll workers are, uh, that the poll watchers that watch the vote count, that watch the vote, uh, people voting, have to leave when the uh, officials do the official counting. Nobody's there but the officials to watch the counting, not even the press or not even the poll uh, watchers. And how do we know that the vote is counted accurate if they don't count it before the public? Uh, shouldn't that be like it was years ago? I think it changed in 1980. Years ago, they let the public sit in there and watch them count the vote, and then uh, uh, come on to the end of the count. But now they send the poll workers out when they begin the poll watchers out when they begin to count the vote, and we'll let the poll watchers just watch the people that come in and vote uh, rather than, uh, and then that. Okay, well, hang on on that. You got a lot of points you're rambling on there, Ron, and let's let's hit those first two. Do you want to revisit for us, I mean, the way it was, I, I'm curious what he was saying about observing the vote, and I know the actual count has to be in a secure setting. Talk about how that goes about to make sure, because he has some questions about whether or not, you know, all right, well, who's watching the watchers? Really, uh, uh, I'm not really an expert on this issue, and I, I, I really concede to the idea that basically the uh, uh, the count, uh, I think this is a question of public trust, the civil servants who do the, the actual counting, that they can be trusted to be accurate, that there are checks on them, um, and certainly I think uh, totals and, and uh, otherwise can be checked quite uh, by outside observers. Um, my own sense is that this has not been a, a major issue or a major concern, but obviously in these very polarized times, people are, are becoming uh, quite worried. I, I would go to the caller's point about Florida, though. Um, it is the case that in 2000, Al Gore did call up George W. Bush to concede the election and then call him back to take back his concession uh, because Florida turned out to be much closer, uh, a much closer call and uh, then the whole um, situation legally about counting the ballots in Florida went on for almost a month afterwards until the Supreme Court put an end to that count. Now, people have gone ahead and tried to do an accurate count of Florida since, and actually one of the studies came up with the idea that Bush did indeed win Florida by about 87 votes or, or 90 votes or something like that. So it was a very narrow win in Florida, and that probably did get confirmed. All right. And so I, should people then be fairly confident? I, it was a story that I read 
this morning in the newscast out of, I think it was uh, Boston, Massachusetts. They are now on the process of putting out some photos of these two individuals that are accused of setting fire to a ballot box there uh, on the <laughs> square there where people were dropping off their ballots. And unfortunately, there were more than 100 ballots in there. And about 80 of them were salvaged, but around 60 or so were damaged to the point where they may not be able to be properly read. And um, mm -hmm. so they're, they're saying anyone who voted at this box during this time period needs to check online and see if it came up for you. And if it didn't, you're entitled to vote again. But I mean, you know, I mean, when I read that, I'm like, what the heck? A, a ballot box is in a position somewhere where, you know, two mm -hmm. lowlifes, whoever these scumbags are, set it on fire, you know, trying to cause trouble. And I'd love to catch them and I'd love to bury them under a prison. So what, what exactly, you know, how, how confident can we be when something like that happens? Well, I think we can, you know, one of the problems of a national media is that a case, once one isolated case can come to serve as a symbol for everything. And I, I think it is the case that you've got people doing crazy things, but I think, you know, that one has to keep these things in proportion and recognize that uh, this is likely not to change uh, the outcome, uh, and particularly in Massachusetts, where Biden's likely to win with probably two thirds of the vote. I doubt it's going to change anything right. there. So, uh, you know, where it gets, where it is troublesome, of course, is in the battleground states where we did have a very, very narrow contest the last time. But I, you know, I think this time, um, I, I, my own sense is that it probably won't be quite as close election this time, but it, it uh, you know, certainly that could happen. Uh, but I think we have to be careful, and this is the danger of sort of national attention and the tendency to, to look at the most extreme cases. We keep a, a, some perspective on this. Yeah, and again, that, that doesn't bleed over into voter fraud. This was vandalism, and who knows what the, the motivation right. was by these folks involved or if they even knew what they were setting on fire. But beyond that, and you're right, you don't want to blow that out of proportion. I don't think anyone is. It's just frustrating that some ballots may have been lost and they right. have to vote again. But um, with regard, and it's time and again, an awful lot of people early voting and an awful lot of people voting by mail. And if you <laughs> would, historically speaking, okay, while there have been isolated incidents of fraud with regard to voting in, in U.S. Mm -hmm. history, um, with regard to voting by mail, and I, I know the president has said, well, it's just awful, it's awful. The, the fact is, there is not a clear-cut example in, in U.S. history of widespread voter fraud when it comes to mail-in ballots, period. And the FBI has backed that up. Yeah, yeah. yes. And, um, you know, the, the, the actual occasions of voter fraud that have taken place in U.S. history usually did not involve uh, vote by mail. They usually involved uh, city political machines. Uh, the Chicago political machine was famous for voting the cemeteries of Chicago uh, back in the 1940s and 50s. You know, that or Tammany Hall in New York City. Those types of cases of, of, of trying to pad the uh, the voter rolls. But those were fairly isolated cases. Um, they occurred in specific periods in U.S. history. They usually involved these political machines in uh, urban areas. Um, so there, it, it, this is generally not uh, a real issue these days. Gotcha. Let's take some more phone calls for you. And we have next up is Candy. Good morning, hey, Candy. Hey. Hi, Candy. Hi, good morning, Nick. Good morning. How good are you? Good. Nice to hear from you, ma'am. You too. I just, I just want to say something. Okay. I have never in my young life until now ever experienced so much um, about voting fraud, and then the gentleman speaking of 1940s, 1950s, 1980s, okay, we're in 2020, and it's ridiculous how these people are acting. You know what, Nick? I, I don't got so now. I don't care who wins. <laughs> I just want this to stop, and we get this voting in November the 3rd, and call it a day. It's all this <laughs> knick-knack, paddywhack, give a dog a bone. Everybody <laughs> saying this and that. Um, you, you know, me, you, and whoever, your guests or whatever, whoever you voted for, that's great. But it's got to stop, man. It's getting mm -hmm. ridiculous. It it's really is. It's gotten on my last nerve. i just be glad <laughs> when November 3rd get here and we all can settle down. You all have right. a good morning. Thank you, ma'am, so much for your call. I think a lot of people would agree. A lot of us, I think, take a, uh, a deep sigh after the election is over, though you may feel differently depending on who wins. But, right. Professor, I mean, I hear what she's saying, 
But even after this election, regardless of who wins, I mean, what we're seeing right now during this campaign is, is part of a symptom of what's happening in this country anyway. So I hate to break it to her, but I don't think all that much is going to change when the election is over in terms of the divisiveness that is still out there, regardless of who wins. I think that's probably right, that there'll be uh, still a, a pretty substantial division um, among Americans. I, I do think it, uh, there, there may be a pause of some sort. Um, I would think that's probably more likely if Biden wins, uh, because in, in many respects, uh, that may uh, uh, satisfy his supporters. And to a certain extent, they've been more vocal on uh, their dislike of President Trump, and, and Biden is a less polarizing figure. So it may fade somewhat. If President Trump is reelected, I expect that you will see, for example, fairly large demonstrations and other uh, examples of this. You're right, uh, elections don't necessarily settle things. Um, a decisive election might, uh, might still some of the uh, anger in the country, but it, it, if it's very close, you might continue to see a lot of uh, very angry voices out there. Yeah, all right, let's go next to uh, Tom. Tom, good morning, hi Tom. Hey, good morning, Nick. How are you doing? Good. What's on your mind, sir? Well, I have a couple of things. Uh, well, one's the uh, electoral votes. I never got into that too much. Well, if you have, uh, we got 11, I think, in the state of Tennessee. And if all 11 of them's Republicans, you know, and I vote Democrat, my vote don't count. <laughs> or if all of them's Democrat, and if I'm a Republican, my vote don't count. I think the electoral votes should be eliminated. And I'm like that lady said a while ago, I'm about tired of all this election and all this stuff's going on because for the next four years, it doesn't matter who gets in there. It's all going to be fighting in the White House. They're not paying attention to the public. They're all up there fighting against each other. And what are we going to get done? Huh? Nothing. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, again, he's echoing that. Any thoughts on what he said there? Well, the interesting thing is the Electoral College is an interesting, uh, has come up for a lot of debate. There are some Democrats who want to abolish it and make for a straight popular vote. Um, it's interesting, uh, this is one of those points of trivia, but we don't have to have a winner-take-all system for the Electoral College votes in Tennessee. Uh, the Tennessee legislature could change the way that's distributed and say, for example, if Tennessee went 60-40 for Trump, that he would get 60% of the electoral votes and 40% uh, would go to Biden. So states can change. There are two states, Maine and Nebraska, which do congressional districts rather than a winner-take-all system for the electoral votes. So it's not it mandated in, uh, in, in federal law that you actually do it that way. And um, I think to some extent that might make for a better system, but neither party wants to change it since both feel that they benefit from winner-take-all states. You know, and it's interesting just to, to look at the Electoral College again. And I know depending on your mm -hmm. partisanship, I mean, those who are Republican may feel, because let's face it, it helped the president get into office, that the Electoral College mm -hmm. is fine, let's stick with it. And they're saying some Democrats, mm -hmm. you know, say, well, it should be popular vote. If you take the partisanship out of it, uh, the original reason for the Electoral College to come into play, maybe you can just briefly just lay that out, because really on its surface, when you talk about elections, don't you think, you know, especially in this day and age, now that uh, aside from partisanship it's just vote the whole country and whoever gets the most most votes wins i mean it's pretty basic why is the electoral college in place and maybe it was needed more at one time but perhaps the argument could be now that it's not needed anymore and that it could just be let's just vote the whole darn country and whichever candidate gets the most wins that's the way elections work right well, yes and no. I mean, uh, when you've got a country as big as the United States with as many diverse interests, states and regions, um, sheer majority voting might end up becoming very alienating to groups that are uh, that don't feel they get a voice. And so to a certain extent, the Electoral College is designed to give 
uh, various regions and other parts of the country more voice. Obviously, there are a lot of problems. Like I say, that you could alter the Electoral College to, to make it more majoritarian, to make it more reflective of the popular vote. But it, originally, the Electoral College came into being because the founders were uncertain about the best way to elect the president. And uh, they wanted to actually have a fairly elite group, the electors who would be chosen by state legislatures, um, being able to select the president. So originally, it didn't have anything to do with popular voting. Um, that only changed over time, particularly the uh, election of Andrew Jackson was sort of a turning point in that. But the original idea was not, uh, you know, in the country of the, the 18th century, the idea of having uh, an election without the sort of technological aids that we have and all the rest, uh, that was thought that you should uh, really do it with a very select group and that um, uh, the selection of the president should be held only by those who, who really understood the politics of the time. So it's, it's actually evolved over time into the institution we know today. Yeah, it's just odd when you see an election like the last one with the president who won the Electoral College but lost the popular vote. How can someone right. who wins the popular vote not become president? Well, because in our system, the Electoral College comes into play and that. But I mean, don't forget, President Trump did not get more votes. He got more right. electoral college votes, but not individual votes, but that's the way the system was set up, so he won. And it's just it's just quirky. That doesn't happen. More often than not, uh, the result of presidential elections, am I right? How often does it happen that it's a split like that? Is it usually the winner gets both? Yes, and, and in American history, I think it's five times that we've had the other circumstance. I so gotcha. it, is, it is relatively rare. Um, but, you know, there would be disadvantages to straight popular vote. You would basically have the candidates only campaigning in California, New York, and Florida. I mean, they would not, in, in that sense, it, it, the population centers, the big areas, would dictate what happens. And so to a certain extent, uh, there are ways in which the Electoral College does force candidates to, to go into other parts of the country yeah. that they normally would not. You know, with that in mind and trying not to be partisan one way or the other for me, I think the best way mm -hmm. that might work is maintain the Electoral College, but do kind of what those two states do do, which is if 60 percent mm -hmm. of Tennessee went for Trump and 40 percent went for Biden, well, six out of 10 of the Electoral College you know, members will go for Trump and four will go for Biden. I mean, maybe set it up that way. Maybe that's a fair way to do it. I don't know. There's smarter people than me out there on that front. Listen, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, we've got more calls and another stay there. The number seven three seven seven five. If you have a question for Professor Schwartz or would like to comment on what you see happening in the final nine days before the presidential election, love to hear from you. We'll be back with more right after this.